lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. But I wasn't joking. My grandmother actually was from Glasgow, grew up in Paisley, educated in Edinburgh, but came to New York. Her and my aunt always sound like they just walked out of the gobbles. Um, <laughs> She could speak like you, but I speak like Bugs Bunny, Robert De Niro, and James Cagney. <laughs> Such it is. Always good to be back in bunny old Scotland. Nonetheless, let's continue. Once upon a time, there was a mathematician from the university in Edinburgh named Angus. He was from Edinburgh and he was a mathematician in the university. Quite a guy, expert in geometry. Euclidean geometry, plane and solid geometry, elliptical geometry, he liked geometry. But oddly enough, he married a wee last name Mary from Pitlockery. And she ran a bakery, she ran a bake shop. And one day they had a terrible, terrible argument, an awful falling out. It was unbelievable that two people who had been so much in love almost ended up in a divorce court over such a stupid argument. There were three pies in front of them. There was in a rectangular corningware Pyrex dish, a shepherd's pie. Then there was a nice round margarita pizza pie. And then there was a very sweet and tasty lemon meringue pie. And the argument began by someone asking them which was the odd one out. And of course, looking at it from a baker's perspective, Mary, his scotch blue bell, said to him, well, obviously, the odd one out is the lemon meringue pie. The other two were savory, that one is sweet. <clears throat> well, Angus retorted, that's ridiculous. The odd one out is the shepherd's pie, the other two are round. So they began arguing. She kept saying it was about the ingredients and he kept saying, if she kept saying it's the ingredients of the pie. He kept saying, no, it's not, it's about pi r square. And they were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> who was right and who was wrong? <laughs> this evening I'd like to discuss what is one of my least favorite subjects in the world. One of my least favorite subjects in scripture. But it's the sum of thy word is truth as we just pointed out up in Sterling Forest at Gartmore. If it's in there, God put it in there for a reason. What happens when godly men disagree? What happens when solid believers disagree? I'm not talking about carnal or worldly-minded believers versus Christ-centered spiritual ones. I'm not talking about flaky, experiential ones who are run by their emotions thinking it's spiritual versus ones who are truly filled with the Spirit and focused on God's Word. I'm talking about when two solid believers, even two solid elders or pastors, deacons, two older sisters in the Lord, two solid believers disagree and fall out. <clears throat> well, sometimes these things can be quite detrimental. They can be detrimental to families. They can be detrimental to ministries. They can be detrimental to churches. They can be detrimental to the body of Christ at large. What happens when two godly brethren in Christ 
sharply disagree over an issue. Now, if it's a fundamental doctrinal issue, or if it's a moral issue, there shouldn't be much scope for disagreement. If it is a fundamental truth of God's word or something morally related, there shouldn't be much disagreement. But other times, there can be significant disagreement. Well, we have one such disagreement, of course, in the book of Acts. But let's begin by talking about someone called John Mark. John Mark. Speculatively, some people have attempted to identify him with no real evidence as the young man who ran away naked in Mark's nativity narrative when the arrest of Jesus happened. But let's see what we do know about him. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 12. Peter's arrested. An angel springs him from the prison by supernatural intervention. Verse 12 of chapter 12, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered and were praying to get Peter out of prison. There was a prayer meeting in the house of his mother. This kid, young man, was a Cypriot Jew with family in Israel, something you find quite common today, things like that, it's diasporic Jews with family in Israel, and they were having a prayer meeting because Peter had been arrested. The prayers are answered, the angel gets Peter out of the prison, and Peter goes straight to the house where John Mark's family lives. He was around from a very early point in the church. He was well known, his family was well known. He and his family were associated with Peter. Scholars are not certain if he's the Mark who is the evangelist who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Some think he is, some are not sure. But those who think he is say that he was actually, because he was a Cypriot Jew, he knew better Greek than Peter did, and he, he simply translated at Peter's dictation into a better grade of Greek when he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Um, scholars believe in Mark in priority. They believe Mark was the first of the Gospels ever written. And uh, there's good reason to believe it. But there's also substantial reason to believe that Mark's Gospel was actually the Gospel of Peter. It may have been this man, and there's reason to think it may have been. So we read about him. He's around from an early point. Chapter 12, verse 25. The word of the Lord continues to grow and multiply, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they fulfilled their mission, taking with them John, who was also called Mark. He was not a complete newcomer to their team. He was somebody, again, who'd been around in the early church, associated with the original apostles, and he was a underling, a sidekick, a trainee, a protege of Barnabas and Saul. Notice it says, Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas comes first. Here the problem incipiently begins to take shape. Turn with me please to the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 36. And Joseph a Levite of Cyprian birth who was also called Barnabas by the apostles which is Aramaic not Hebrew meaning son of encouragement. Now you have to understand the church had not yet separated or been separated from Judaism. The temple was still standing. And by virtue of the fact he was a Levite, that he was Levitical, that would have meant something. He was a member of the temple clergy. Oh, we've got a, actually got a rabbi who's a believer. Oh, we've got a, uh, we've got, we've got a Levite who's a believer. That, that, that was, would have been their thinking. 
But he was right around from Acts 4. He was around with the Peter and the apostles. He would have seen Jesus and so forth. And it's Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas is the senior partner, the son of encouragement. His alternate name indicates his character, his ministry. He was an encouraging older brother type figure. That's what he was. It indicates his character. So far, no problem, though, even though something is already festering. At least the mechanisms are in place. Chapter 13 of Acts, the first missionary journey. They were all fasting and praying. A number of leaders are there. Barnabas and Simeon, who's called Niger, Lucius of Serene and Manian, who've been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Well, people of prestigious backgrounds in the church as well as ordinary ones. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. And when they laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. And when they reached Salmus, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. Now for the second time, John is with them, John Mark. The first time was when they were the delegation sent to Jerusalem. The second time is the first missionary journey. Now notice, it had been some years, at least eight, since Paul was knocked off the horse since Paul became a believer. When we read the parallel accounts of Paul's conversion, we see that he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles from the beginning. But despite the fact he was called from the beginning, despite the fact that he'd been a rabbi from the school of uh, Hillel, trained by Rabbi Gamaliel, despite the fact that he was a Greco-Roman intellectual, that his learning was even recognized by the pagans, Paul, your great learning has driven you mad. Both the pagans and the church and the Jews, they recognized his, his education and his learning. Despite that, he wound up being lowered out the window of the wall of Damascus in a basket and disappears for years. Probably at that time he communes with Christ in Arabia. Then he comes back. Just because somebody has human credentials, just because somebody has a human ability, even a human ability that's been sanctified to God's service after they're born again, does not mean they're ready for ministry. It took years before God had Paul ready to go out. He had all the formal education, he had all the credentials, but he was not ready yet. There are countries in the world that will never allow in a missionary or an evangelist, but they will allow in a teacher, a physician, an agricultural expert, and God can make use of all of those academic credentials. But being a physician does not make one a medical missionary. Being multilingual does not make one an evangelist to the third world. Being a stage actor or a barrister does not automatically make one a preacher, even though they have eloquence, as Apollos did. Human ability, education, background, sanctified to God's service is something God can and does make use of after he's crucified the person and taught them not to trust in their ability or their education but to trust in him, then he can make use of it. Now I can tell you that, but I can't teach you that. No preacher can teach you that. A preacher can tell you that, a Bible expositor can tell you that, but only the Holy Spirit can teach us that. And he's a guy who had all the credentials. No, the ministry is not a mere profession or even a mere vocation. It wasn't until God said, now is the time, that the Holy Spirit said, set out for me Barnabas and Saul. He's still playing second fiddle to Barnabas, the son of encouragement. John Mark goes with them. Story continues. They go out. Now notice something. When the Holy Spirit sends somebody to the mission field, to a foreign mission field, you send veterans. You do not send 
amateurs. I'm not talking about the youth group from your church going to Guatemala and building a Sunday school in the third world or something like that for a summer youth project. That's no problem. But to actually send evangelists and missionaries to other cultures, other countries, when the Lord does that, when the Holy Spirit designates that, notice they were all doing it. It wasn't just somebody coming and putting their hands on them and giving them a prophecy, the Lord told me you should go to Uganda. There's safety in an abundance of counselors. When the Lord leads, even if there may be some kind of a prophetic dimension to God's revelation and leading, it is only one of several indicators. All the indicators work in harmony, and it's not just one person. There's safety in an abundance of counselors. They were really seeking the Lord. You don't send amateurs to foreign mission fields. They no sooner got there than they were up against the occult and all sorts of things. I recall when I first went to Indonesia and when I first went to East Africa, I was up against witch doctors and things that I'd only seen on television. It's unbelievable what goes on in the third world. And the, the superstition that binds people, it's, it's... Young believers shouldn't be dealing with that. Well, now notice certain things about Paul. Let the leaders be tested. Being tested, as I've always pointed out, does not mean simply passing Hebrew and Greek exams in Bible college or seminary. That comes later. Being tested means how did you stand up in the face of opposition, persecution, demonic oppression, financial hardship, frail health. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness before he was God's agent, equipped to lead a nation through the wilderness for 40 years. Unless somebody has been saved a while, been around the block a few times, stood on the trials when their ministry was attacked, when their health was attacked, when their marriage was attacked, whatever, their finances were scant, only then can they be God's vehicle to guide and encourage others through it by the power of His Spirit. Young believers should not have hands laid on them, Paul says, too quickly. You've got people leading youth groups simply because they can play guitar and they have charismatic personalities. There's a big difference between human charisma and biblical charismata. <laughs> the instances I've known of youth ministers becoming immorally involved with young girls, and the, the, these things happen all the time. And what used to be worship simply becomes entertainment, etc. Well, at least they're keeping the kids off the street. Oh. Believe me, sooner or later, Unless there's substance, the street's going to win. We were on our way over here tonight. We got attacked by some kids with eggs. My wife got hit in the head with an egg. <laughs> uh, actually, once she got hit in the head with a roller pin, that's why she married me. But <laughs> tonight it was only an egg. So it is. They go to the mission field. But they've got somebody with them who's not quite up to it. Barnabas and Saul were. John Mark, well, let's see what happens here. Then, after you've been around the block a few times, then go learn Greek and Hebrew and literary criticism. Then go learn biblical archaeology and apologetics. Then it will do you some good. But an academic knowledge of God's Word, a scholarly knowledge of God's Word, will be useless in the ministry unless you have walked the walk of faith. Then go get a theological education. Then God can bless it. But let's continue. There's an organization that has no scriptural right to exist. I say this openly. Some of their so-called missionaries have only been saved three months. They have people who are in Roman Catholicism, still praying the rosary, being sent out as missionaries with this organization. And the last I heard, they were in the Pacific telling Polynesians that you can call Jesus by the name of Io, the Polynesian volcano god. Before missionaries came to Hawaii, they were throwing infant babies into a volcano sacrificially to placate Eo to stop the lava flows from burying their villages, and now that's the name of Jesus. I speak of an organization called Youth at the Mission. It has no scriptural right to exist. It is completely unbiblical. It has no scriptural right to exist. 
They can tell you God has used it. Well, God will use anything. I got saved through a cult called the Children of God. Despite ourselves, God may use us. But the model is not biblical. Mission is what we see in Acts 13. Serious people seeking the Lord. And the Lord said, set out for me. Barnabas and Saul. John Mark comes with them as a trainee, perhaps. And things are not that easy. But they get to Perga in verse 13. Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Perga is Pergamum. Jesus said it's where Satan's throne is. I've been there many times. Many times. Jesus actually said it's where Satan's throne is. Almost certainly making reference to the altar of Zeus. The foundation stone still being there in the Acropolis over the city. The capstones were taken to Berlin in the early 20th century. Shortly afterwards, Adolf Hitler came to power. Then, of course, it became the Brandenburg Gate, the gateway into the Iron Curtain, into the communist world. I'm not saying that's because Satan moved his throne to Berlin, but I am saying I can't rule out there's some spiritual dimension to it either. <laughs> it's, it's more than curious. I'm not hyper-charismatic by any means, but the factual reality of what Jesus said scripturally and the historical reality of what happened with that altar. Now, Zeus was the corruption of the word Theos, God, who the Romans would later identify with the planet Jupiter, but Pergamum became the gateway of Eastern religions that began in ancient Babylon into the Western Judeo-Christian world. We know what happened exactly. We know that false religion began with Semiramis and so forth in Babylon, the Tower of Babel, etc. But when in fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah, particularly Isaiah, but also of Jeremiah and Joel, but particularly Isaiah, Babylon fell to the Persians. The priestly class of Persia, there were 300 official priests of, of the mystery religions of, of Babylon when the Persians took it over. They migrated in unison westward. They migrated westward and set up shop in Pergamum. Pergamum became New Testament Babylon. The same mystery religions that be, were in Babylon that fell under, un, under Cyrus, when Cyrus conquered it, as Jeremiah predicted, they literally, the priesthood literally relocated to Pergamum. Mithras worship from Egypt came up from the south. The Jupiter worship from Europe came from the north and the west. And the mystery religions of Babylon came from the east. And Jesus spoke of this place where Satan's throne is. What's really, really phenomenally interesting and rather disturbing is the following. I see people today, even in churches, running around with personality profiling, like the shape thing. This one is melancholic, this one is choleric, this one is sanguine. That goes back to Gallon of Pergamum. <laughs> that goes back to Gallon of Pergamum, who set up his quote-unquote clinic underneath the throne of Satan. Still there, you can see the Scaducus and the inscriptions and the archaeological ruins, you can still see it. And he was into personality typing, which he related to four bodily fluids, blood and... <laughs> That's what he did. This it's, is not new. The pseudoscience of psychology. It is neither scientific, nor <laughs> it's certainly not science, but it's certainly not a religion in any divine sense, it's simply the religion of, of, of man, of, of, of humanism, as we pointed out at our conference. Secular psychology is bogus. We can talk about psychiatric medicine, or we can talk about neuropsychology or biopsychology, but behavioral psychology, Young, Freud, Laszlo, and these things are absolute rubbish. They have no quantitative basis scientifically, and they have no theological basis. People are three-dimensional, body, soul, and spirit, because we're Maggio Dei beings. We're not simply apes with better DNA. Our spiritual dimension is unique. It is not simply part of the mind, as Jung taught or as Eastern religion teaches. It's not the collective unconscious. Psychology was demonic, and it was ancient. It did not begin with Freud and with Jung and with Laszlo. It goes back to Pergamum. 
This was a seriously bad place. John Mark, he wasn't up to it. Things progress. We get to one of those chapters that the Roman Catholic Church had a big problem with for centuries. One of those chapters that was responsible for putting the scriptures on the index of banned books. They would, in certain cases, burn people for having the scriptures. One of the chapters that caused them the most problems was Acts 15. Until now, initially most believers were Jewish or Gentile God-fearers who converted to Judaism. Now a message comes where you can have the same salvation as a Jew without undergoing ritual conversion. They might have got me as a baby, but they wouldn't get me now. I recall the circumcision of our infant son if I never told you the true story. A medically trained rabbi called the Moyle came over to where we lived on Mount Carmel in Israel and I was holding my son when he was eight days old, hyperprothrombic, etc. And I said the prayers in Hebrew. The rabbi took the cotton ball and dipped it in the wine. I said, what's the wine for? He said, to deaden the pain. I said, if that kid could see that knife, he'd say, keep the wine, bring me some Glen Morangi. <laughs> You had a number of pagans who believed in the Jewish God, who understood the futility and the immorality associated with pagan culture. They believed the Hebrew scriptures, they read the Septuagint in Greek, and they believed it, but they did not want to undergo ritual conversion by circumcision. Now the gospel comes and all they have to do is trust Jesus, salvation by faith, saved by grace, you can have the same benefit spiritually and salvifically as a Jew. They begin flooding into the church. Where do I sign up? This is too good to be true. <coughs> but it becomes an issue for the original believers who are all Jewish. Now my family is a mixture of Irish, Catholic, and Jewish, the worst two races of people in the world. And as you know better than I, there's no Irish worse than the Glasgow Irish, but let's not go there. <laughs> St. Augustus, my grandmother went there. Anyway, it becomes an issue, so they have the first church council. There will always be a primus inter paris in church leadership. There will always be a primus inter paris, a first among equals. Initially, it was Peter, plainly, in the day of Pentecost, going to the Samaritans, going to Cornelius, the first Gentiles, plainly initially it was Peter. Later on, it becomes James. Later on, Paul, later on, at the end of the first century, it was John. There'll always be a primus into Paris. There are different models of ecclesiastical polity, church government, call it what you want. I believe, however, the principle is a plurality of elders. The senior pastor is the primus inter paris, the first among equals. You may have three elders, you may have five, but there's going to be a primus inter paris, the first among equals. But it may not always be the same person at the same time. Now this conflicted with the beliefs of Roman Catholicism. But it also began to cause a problem in the relationship between Paul and Barnabas later on. When Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus became Paul. <laughs> it begins by saying Barnabas and Paul but eventually it says Paul and Barnabas when a disciple is fully discipled he becomes co-equal with the one who discipled him just like uh, McDonald and son locksmiths the old man was a good locksmith taught the kid to trade but the kid has some newfangled ideas Listen, we have to get a website, and we have to go into electronic locking that people can unlock their doors with their cell phone. And the father says, I've been doing it this way without cell phones and without websites for 57 years. Before you were born, I was a locksmith. My father taught me to trade. So the old man is going one way, the kid's going another. The father can't accept that the kids become his equal. 
Barnabas has to accept that Saul is now Paul. It becomes a problem. Now the primus inter Paris at the first church council is not Peter. Let's look who's doing the talking. Verse 13 of Acts 15. After they'd stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Notice James is presiding. Now if Peter was the Pope, if he had the keys, if he had the fisherman's shoes, why is James presiding at the first church council? Verse 19. Therefore, the magisterium of the church is determined on the basis of the infallibility of the pontiff. No, 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 no. <laughs> Therefore, it is my judgment, not Peter the Pope's, says James, that we, corporate, collective, the primus in the Paris is the presider who speaks, but it's always a collective leadership. We do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, etc., that chapter caused a big problem for the medieval papacy. A big, big problem. A big problem. Why is James presiding instead of Peter? Whenever you have a shift in leadership, whenever you have a shift in primus inter paris, or whenever the discipled becomes co-equal to the discipler, things can flare up very easily. I was around from the time of Pentecost. Who are you? You were persecuting the church when I was preaching the gospel. Now you're my... There's a human dimension in all of us. One of the things I love about the scripture is it's not hagiographic. It makes it clear that the only one who was always right all the time was Jesus. The greatest figures in scripture, the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, they all goofed up. James is emphatic. Elijah was a man like us. <laughs> this is not true of the pseudo-logons, of the false words of God. The Book of Mormon will never tell you that Joseph Smith was a swindler and, and, and a serial polygamist. The Quran is never going to tell you Muhammad was a pedophile. You have to read the Hadith to find that out. They're never going to tell you the truth. They all have halos. The scripture tells you the truth. It shows people's good points and bad points. It shows you their virtues and their character deficits. <laughs> well, things progress. This becomes a classic meaning of binding and loosing, luo and deo in Greek, a sword and hetir in Hebrew. It is one of the two meanings of binding and loosing. For the sake of those watching on YouTube or something, or Roku, if you don't know, binding and loosing is not, I believe God for that Mercedes Benz, hallelujah. We just loose that Mercedes Benz in the name of Jesus. I just believe God for that Ferrari, hallelujah. I loose that Ferrari in the name of the Lord. By faith in Jesus. You think I'm joking? Go to Oklahoma and turn on the radio. That's not binding and loosing. Binding and loosing has to do with either dealing with unrepentant sin in the fellowship or the apostolic authority to define doctrine. The Gentiles are loosed from these other things. They can eat shrimp, they can worship on a day other than Shabbat, Saturday. They can light up the fire. They're loosed from the law, but they're bound to keep these other things. No idolatry, no immorality. No strangulation, which was not only cruelty to animals, but it had a pagan association with it. And uh, obviously they, the consumption of blood. Another problem for the Church of Rome. If they believe in transubstantiation and that the wine actually becomes blood, why are they drinking it? Vampire religion. Cannibalism is plainly outlawed by the apostles under the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you believe it's as real blood, why are you drinking it? You see why they had to put this on the index of BAM books? Well, let's look. All right, it's all settled. So it seems. Verse 
Verse 35, Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch after the conference, the council, they went back, preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, now notice they were always sent out by somebody. Apostolic authority was only ever singular concerning Jesus. He has the definite article in Hebrews 4. He is the apostle. All apostolic authority derives from him. Wherever you see it, it was always plural. You've got these people today, these restoration movements and these heavy shepherding churches claiming apostolic authority. All that is is heavy shepherding. It's the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It's the heavy shepherding, as Ezekiel calls it, in Ezekiel 34. We don't know who or what the Nicolaitans were, but we know what the word means in Greek. Nico, suppression of the people. That's all that garbage is. This, you know, autocratic leadership. I'm the apostle, they claim apostolic authority. That's not how apostolic authority has ever worked. This is the way it worked. Today, apostolic authority only exists in two ways. From the Greek word. One is church planting missionaries. The Greek word for church planting missionary would be an apostle. But not an apostle like Peter, James, John, and Paul who were the apostles who saw the Lord and who wrote the scriptures. Today, the only place that kind of apostolic authority exists is in the writing of the apostles. Do we have apostolic authority in the church? Yeah, in the writing of the apostles. It was doctrinal. It was not a control management uh, human resource enterprise. It was the apostolic authority to define doctrine. Let's continue. So after some days in verse 36, Paul said to Barnabas, now it is not Barnabas and Saul, it is Paul and Barnabas. Natural course of events, but it can lead to problems. Just like McDonald and son, the locksmiths. Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. And Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with them. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. The prototypic mission team is dissolved due to a disagreement between two apostles, two very godly men, both of whom saw Jesus. Now what I see happening most of the time when disagreements like this happens is an emotionally charged religiosity from some quarters. It goes something like this. <laughs> Where's the love? <laughs> Where's the humility? <laughs> if we just came together and counted others greater than ourselves, this wouldn't happen. <laughs> if we just came together and sought the Lord in prayer, he'd sort it all out. <laughs> We're grieving the Lord. <laughs> Give me a break, Jack. Weren't the apostles familiar with those principles? Didn't the apostles know those things? Why did God put this in his work? Because if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. Because if it can happen among the apostles, it can happen in any church, any ministry, any mission organization. Godly men disagree. Seems like a victory for the devil. 
And there's no doubt he tries to exploit such things for his purposes. That's for sure. That's, but that's a given. We know that. But what's really? Let's look at Colossians 4.10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings and also Barnabas, cousin Mark, about whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. John Mark was related to Barnabas. Now things become more complicated. By God's design, blood is thicker than water. The dimension of family loyalty comes into play in a difference of opinion within the church. Look out. I have seen two mission organizations virtually destroyed by nepotism. There were people on the board from the family, people in the mission field in the family, and if somebody disagreed with a decision or a policy, it was seen as going against the family. You took it personally, and the family closed ranks. Dangerous! Now, God created family loyalty, but anything he uses and intends for good, the enemy will try to corrupt and exploit for evil. When you're dealing with family, objectivity goes out the window. Lawyers are told do not represent family, get a colleague. Physicians are told unless it is an emergency, do not treat a relative. Wrong thing. Objectivity can go out the window too easily when you're dealing with family. So now, instead of Barnabas and Saul, it's Paul and Barnabas. And now there's a family dimension factor in the equation. And then we have John Mark himself. Quite a situation! Who was right? And who was wrong? Was Paul right? Or was Barnabas right? Now I again emphasize, if it was a doctrinal situation, dealing with a fundamental doctrine or heresy, or if it was a moral issue, somebody would have been right, somebody would have been wrong. Look very quickly, please, to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Another chapter the Roman church doesn't like, for obvious reasons. Verse 11, but when Cephas, that's the Latinization of Kaifa of Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Paul was clearly right. There was hypocritical behavior. This doctrinal issue had been settled at the council, black and white. Unless, of course, you're a Roman Catholic. When is the last time you saw a bishop, and they say that the bishops are the heirs of the apostles, telling the Pope off in public? <laughs> this is another passage that has always caused the Church of Rome a problem. By the way, my mother's family are Roman Catholic. I have nothing against Catholic people. I love Catholic people. I want them to know the truth. Our family is a mixture of Irish, Catholic, and Jewish, the worst two races of people in the world. If you can't con them, slug them. I want Catholic people to be saved, and I want Jewish people to be saved. Therefore, I tell them the truth. Talmudic Judaism is not scriptural and either is the Church of Rome. Ask an ex-Catholic. Don't ask an ecumenical Protestant, whatever that is. Ask somebody saved out of Rome what it is. We have any ex-Catholics here? God bless you, you did the right thing. Let's look. Well, who's right, who's wrong? Is Paul right? Was Barnabas right? 
Should we have taken him or not taken him? Barnabas says, now look, Paul, remember when you were younger? Younger in the Lord? Look where you came from. You used to persecute the church. He never did that. He was one of the Christians being persecuted. We had to sneak you out of Damascus in a basket. Cut the kid some slack. He has potential. I can see it. I know it's related to you, but we have to be clear-headed and look at the realities, Paul said. Godly people will disagree in situations like this. If the apostles can disagree, anybody can. And at some point will. This kind of situation, or something like it, where there's a difference of opinion that's not based purely on doctrine or morality, can and will divide good brothers. In all kinds of situations, dealing with all kinds of issues. Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, let's see. Paul goes on the mission journey while Barnabas takes John Mark with him to Cyprus. What happened on this second missionary journey? The first one was only a dry run. The second one was much more difficult. Look with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 8, Paul writes, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, the Roman province of Asia, Turkey, when they finally got to Troas and all that. We were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so we despaired of life. Paul and Silas didn't simply give up on the ministry. They didn't want to just give up on the mission field. They wanted to give up on respiration. They wanted to check out. They wanted to die. They gave up on life. The spiritual opposition and the toll it took on them emotionally and practically reached such a height and plunged them to such a low depth spiritually and emotionally, they no longer wanted to be alive. There's no way John Mark could have handled that. The guy who bailed out at Pergamum was not up to it. And then, when they finally got the breakthrough and arrived in Europe at Philippi, they wound up in jail. Then in Thessalonica, there's rejection. Then in Athens, they're up against the Areopagites. It's tougher and tougher. They want to get, seems to get lighter, it gets darker again. The first missionary journey was simply practice for the second one. They despaired of life. Paul despaired of being alive. This is a man who saw Jesus despaired of being alive. There's no way John Mark was ready for that. Plainly, Paul was right and proven right. He was vindicated. Except, this was not the only low point in Paul's life and ministry. He reached another one that every pastor, every true pastor will reach in 2 Timothy. When you get knifed in the back by the very people you give your life and your heart for. If you can be knifed in the back by people you give your life and heart for and not love them any less, then you're a pastor. <laughs> See, when you become a pastor, you get two targets. One in the front and one in the back. The world gives it to you in the front. People in the church give it to you in the back. <laughs> when you become a pastor, you get two targets. You get one in the front and you get one in the back. This was not the only low point, spiritually and emotionally, for Paul. Look with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 11. Only Luke is with me. And after what I've been going through, I need a personal physician. Pick up Mark and bring him with you. He's useful to me for service. Things are tough. 
I need somebody I can rely on. Everybody's bailing out. Everybody's abandoning us. It's only me and Luke. This is terrible. I need somebody we can count on. Where is John Mark? Who? John Mark! But he's the same one you said was a washout. He's the same one you said couldn't handle it. That was then. This is now. Where is he? Barnabas said, listen, I know this kid goofed up. I know this kid's... But he's got potential. I can see it. Let's keep him. Let's give him another shot. Let's get next to him like older brothers. John Mark couldn't have handled what happened to them in Asia. Paul was right. But after Mark had spent time with Barnabas, he could handle anything. Barnabas was right. Missiologically, Paul was right. From the point of view of a missionary, Paul was right and proven right. Pastorally, from the point of view of a pastor, Barnabas was right and proven right. Is it the ingredients of the pie or is it the geometrical shape? Angus looks at it with a geometrical eye. Mary looks at it with a culinary eye. Which one is right? Now Paul would write, our faith is not yes and no, but sometimes it might be yes and yes. <laughs> These things are not always as straightforward and clear as we would like. If it's a basic doctrinal issue, that should be clear. If there's a moral issue, that should be clear. But when you deal with relationships and policies, different people are going to see it differently. A dentist is a physician concerned with teeth. Pediatrician is a physician concerned with childhood diseases. A cardiologist is a physician concerned with heart disease. People tend to see things from their own perspective, be they a baker or a mathematician, be it the ingredients of the pie or be it pi r square. That's just the way it is. From the point of view of a missionary, you can't argue with Paul. He called it right. From the point of view of a pastor, you can't argue with Barnabas. He called it right. <laughs> Look with me, please, to Philemon 24. Years later, this stuff is all under the bridge. It's all under the bridge years later. Whatever happened way back is insignificant. In Philemon 24, a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow workers. <laughs> this stuff's all done and forgotten. But while the disagreement was going on, the contention and the discord became so sharp, it ruined the mission team completely. Yet in the providence of God, good came from it for everyone in the longer term. He sees the end from the beginning. You see, it's difficult to understand, but it was right there from Genesis. Turn with me, please, to the book of Genesis. <coughs> Chapter 13. Verse 6. The land could not sustain them. 
while dwelling together, their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen, that is the pastors, as it were, the shepherds, of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling in the land. And Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, we're brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, I'll go to the right. To the right, I'll go to the left. <laughs> and then, of course, when Lot is in trouble in Sodom and Gomorrah, it's Abraham who wants to come to his rescue and plead with God. Notice the problem became because of growth. The problems that resulted in Acts 15 with the split between Barnabas and Saul were a direct result of growth. What a wonderful problem to have, but make no mistake about it. Growth can cause as many problems and create as many challenges as decline. <laughs> when a ministry or a church or a movement is declining, they've got problems. But there's just as many problems when there's blessing and growth. Only the blessing and growth masquerades it. But something's festering all along. And there comes a certain point. Bang. Now Abraham called it right. Remember! The Canaanite and Perizzite are in the land. Remember the heathen, the unbelief, post-Christian, neo-pagan Scotland. People don't know who the covenanters were. They don't know who Samuel Rutherford was. They don't know anything about the gospel. The Muslim is still in the land. The New Ager is still in the land. The Roman Catholic is still in the land. The Perizzite and the Canaanite are still in the land. Keep our eyes fixed on the real opponent, not the brethren. Now, of course, we struggle not against flesh and blood. We're not against the people. It's their belief systems and the issues. Nonetheless, the Perizzite and the Canaanite are in the land. One of them hit my wife in the head with an egg tonight. On the way over here to church. You can't go to church and get hit in the head with an egg. I have to go to Vietnam the end of the month. They hit Christians in the head with a, with, a, with a club for going to church. Quite a thing. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. Plant a new church on the other side of town. You're in Ballaston, I'll go to Whitburn. Let's just keep it peaceful. Sometimes it's better to do it that way. But when Lot was in trouble, Abraham came to his rescue. Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, you see, the real test of our spirituality is not that these things don't happen. That is not the real test of our spirituality. If it happened in the lives and ministries of the apostles and God saw it important enough to put in his word, Expect it can happen to us. Every one of us will have encountered or at some point will encounter this kind of a problem. I can guarantee it. Unless the Lord comes before. It's going to happen. No, the test of our spirituality. The test of our Christ-likeness, even the test of our love. is not that these things don't happen. The test is how we handle them when they do. That's the issue. One can be right pastorally, one right missiologically. It doesn't have to be one is right and one is wrong. Just the way it is. That's just reality. That's the way it is. Nobody's immune from it. Even the apostles weren't immune from it. And either are we. 
When these things happen, dear friends, remember, God allows these things for a reason. He allows these things for a reason. While Paul was right what he said about John Mark, John Mark never would have been so valuable to Paul at a future point had this not happened. And the, the Greek term is eukristos. He's not useful to me. He's quickly profitable to me. He's somebody who can immediately handle the situation and begin turning things around. He couldn't have done that initially. But Barnabas saw the potential. Paul saw it one way, Barnabas another. Jacob might see it one way, Charlie might see it another. It's not always yes or no. Sometimes it's yes and yes. It's not that these things shouldn't happen. It's the way we handle them when they do. But not least of all, and above all, when they do happen, let us remember the Canaanite and the Perizzite are in the land. God bless and thank you so much for joining us tonight.